Well, good morning to you. Um, it's exciting to, to get the update from Dustin and Jill. Um, they, uh, they've been in Calgary since February of 2017. Uh, they've been laying the foundation for the church that will have its very first service today. Uh, our church family has had a chance to be there on a couple of occasions and helping them make some, um, make some contacts with people in the community. So be praying for Dustin and Jill. I know this is an exciting day for them. Uh, I have been hearing a lot from different people who I know who are down east. So a lot of you know my friend Kevin Club. He's the pastor of Cape Carteret Baptist Church. They are right there next to Swansboro. That, that's been right in the heart of some of the worst of the stuff. They've had over 30 inches of rain in Swansboro, and I'm sure Cape Carteret is probably right at that. Kevin does have damage to his house. He's got a, a large section of his roof that was ripped away during the worst of the winds. And so they're, they're going to have some recovery stuff going on. Uh, talked to uh, Kevin Beck. He's in New Bern, which is also one of the early places where we received a lot of the news about flooding and stuff. He's safe. Um, good to hear that Laura and Corey are safe. It's uh, really uh, neat to know that the ministry that Laura and Corey work with is called, or that Laura works with especially, is called Vigilant Hope. And for them to be talking so much about the hope they have and God um, taking care of them, I was reading one of her posts. She was talking about you know, some of the questions that she and uh, Corey were asking before the storm. Where do we take our cars and keep them safe? What about our house? And, and, and it just sort of struck her in the midst of all the questions she was asking herself, how many of the people that she ministers to in that homeless population there in Wilmington don't even consider those kind of questions because they don't have one car, let alone two cars. They don't have a house over with a roof over their head. They don't have some of the things that she was having to deal with. And so I, I, I'm, I'm very grateful for the faith and the, the hope that they have in Christ. And we're grateful that the Lord's keeping them safe and they're on the ground to be able to go help some other people. Well, let's, uh, let's be praying for all those folks. By the way, did that uh, sheet get around? Is, is it still going around, please? Uh, very good, very good. If you're uh, going on that trip, we need to know so we can make that, those plans. We've been working our way through the book of Romans. You can uh, open your Bible to Romans chapter 4 today. Uh, we'll be there eventually. We'll get there in just a little bit, but I have something else that I want to do today that I think will be quite fun. Uh, what Paul does in Romans, he uses Abraham as the prime example of what faith looks like, and he uses all of chapter 4 in Romans, with the exception of a little small section there where he quotes from, from the Psalms from David, but, but most of Romans chapter 4 is Abraham, the man of faith, the absolute uh, main character of the Old Testament. I, you, you might argue with me on that, that Moses is a bigger character, and he certainly gets a lot more press, and he's the one who wrote those first five books of the Bible. Uh, you could say that maybe David is big or bigger than Abraham, and I wouldn't argue necessarily with any of you because they do get so much coverage, and they are so important to the story. But, but for me, when it comes to faith, I say with no reservation at all that Abraham is the paragon of faith. He is the ultimate example. Nobody is more important to understanding what faith looks like than Abraham. And so when I talk about Abraham, I typically assume that most of you know the story. I mean, we all learned this. If you've been in church, we all learned this when we were little. I mean, most of us learned it in Sunday school with those faithful Sunday school teachers who set us down and told us about this man of God who went to the place where God told him to go, and he didn't even know where he was going when he started out. The problem is, is that as I got older, I discovered there were things my Sunday school teachers didn't tell me about. There were things in his story that they didn't, there were details that maybe they had a good reason to skip those details uh, or mention them only in passing, but as an adult, some of those details are incredibly important. So we're going to do something a little fun today. I hope it's fun for you. It's always fun for me. I've always, all of my life, I've been a storyteller. I like to tell stories. And so I want to tell you the story of Abraham today. And I want to tell it in a way that brings in some of the details that are important to the story and help us to process a little bit about who he is. So why don't you pray with me one more time. Let's ask the Lord to open his word to us in a very unique and different kind of way. Okay, would you, Father... This is your word, and I want to always do justice to the word of God. And so while I will be telling this story in my words, I pray, Lord, that your word will be honored. Teach us today, and we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you ready? There was a family who lived in one of the most beautiful and fertile regions of the ancient world. Their hometown was in southern Iraq. But... Today we call that area, or excuse me, in, in their day they called it Chaldea. 
And they were direct descendants, this family was, of one of the most important men of history. Nine generations earlier, God had chosen it to be Noah who would rescue humanity by his grace. And so now the head of this family was a man named Terah. And he lived in a town called Ur, which was just a few miles away from ancient Babylon. Terah had three sons. One was named Haran, the other was Nahor, and the third was Abram. Haran, the oldest son, had a son of his own named Lot, but sadly Haran died with just this one child remaining. Now, we don't know why, but Terah decided to move with his family to the land of Canaan. Maybe it was because he was grief-stricken, because fathers are not supposed to bury their children. But for whatever reason, he decided to move from his home and go to the land of Canaan. And he took Abram and Abram's wife, Sarai, and his grandson, Lot, and they began their journey. Now, unless you want to travel through the desert, the journey from Ur of the Chaldees to Canaan was about 1,200 miles. And so they had to make a little bit of a loop so that they could travel on pathways that were better traveled and provided better resources for them. And about halfway into that trip, they came to this other town named Haran, which not named after Terah's son, but coincidentally, a town that was very much like the town they had come from, and they settled in Haran. Now, we know from archaeological records that that Ur of the Chaldees and this new town that they settled in, Haran, were both fully devoted to the worship of a false god of the moon. And interestingly, you may not know this, But this false god was named Sin. Now the Bible gives us no details about what Terah believed. But it's very likely that given the information we have, and even though he traced his ancestry back to Noah, it's it's entirely likely that Terah was a worshiper of this false god, the god of the moon, named Sin. I mean, why else would he settle in a town named Haran, it was very much like the town they had come from. It was also steeped deeply in this kind of worship. And what that means is is that Terah's children would also have been exposed to this false system, this false ideology. Well, Terah died in Haran. He was 205 years old, and this is really where Abram's story begins. Because somewhere along the line, and we don't know exactly when, but somewhere in these days, God said to Abram, I want you to leave home. Leave your family, and you need to go to a land far away, to a land that I will show you. I'll tell you where to live, and I'm going to bless you big time. In fact, you're going to become the father of a great nation, and you're going to be known as a great man, and you will have people who will be your friends, and you will be a blessing to them, and they will bless you, and because they bless you, they will be my friends also. And there will be some people who will be a curse to you, and they will be my enemies. And Abram, people from all over the world are going to be blessed because of you. Well, now those, those had to be pretty welcome words to Abram because, because he was 75 years old, his wife Sarai was 65, and they had no children. And in a day in which they lived, having children was really the greatest status symbol of all. And so he knew if this is going to happen, it's going to have to, have, have to happen soon because we're not getting any younger. And so Abram left Haran And he moved to the land of Canaan. And this is an important part of his story. When he got there, he built an altar and he worshiped the one true God. Now, he gave up any kind of idea of following this false god of the moon. No more religious observances to the little g gods of the people around him. Abram staked his claim in the God who had spoken to him. Now, I just want you to know, Canaan wasn't an easy place to live. It was a hard place. As often happened in those days, food became scarce and famine came. But they heard that down in the south, in the mighty land of Egypt, there was plenty of food. And it just made sense for Abram to take his family and move to this place of safety. But have I told you yet that that Sarai was a very beautiful woman? That's going to be an important part of Abraham's story. uh, Because she was so beautiful that even at the age of 65... She was a desirable beauty. It was the kind of beauty that drove men crazy and made her want her. In those days, people literally killed other men just so they could steal their wives. I mean, if you think it's hard to date these days, 
you should have lived back then. I mean, there was no swiping left or right or eHarmony or Match.com. If you saw a woman you liked and you killed her husband, she was yours. Well, as Abraham drew near to Egypt, he told Sarai to lie about who she was. Don't say that you're my wife. Tell them you're my sister. And guess what? The men of Egypt saw her, and just as Abram had predicted, they thought she was a desirable beauty. Well, some of the princes of the land also saw her, and they went and they told Pharaoh. And of course, Pharaoh is Pharaoh, and so he gets first dibs, and he went and he took her. And he brought her into his harem, preparing her to be his wife. And here's the crazy thing. Because he thought that she was Abram's sister, Pharaoh rewarded Abram, and he gave him great groups of servants and livestock, and Abram became a wealthy man. Interestingly, however, the exact opposite happened to Pharaoh and his household. They got sick. They were plagued by tragedy, and somehow it came to Pharaoh's attention that all of this that was happening to them was because of Sarai and Abram. I think Pharaoh was afraid. I mean, he believed in all kinds of false gods. He was a very superstitious man. And the kinds of things that happened to his family were obviously the sign of a more powerful God at work. Because evidently the God of Abram and Sarai had greater mojo than his gods. And so he was angry and he sent them away. And the crazy thing is he sent them away and said, take everything I gave you. I just want you to leave and leave now. I mean, a few hundred years later, another Pharaoh would have the exact same opportunity to send God's people out and to let them go, but he wouldn't be as wise as this Pharaoh, and he would pay the consequence for that. You know, this all shows us somewhat of the the picture of God's grace because we know that Abram had been promised already that he was going to be the father of nations, of a nation and a great people, and yet he put this promise at risk, at jeopardy, by allowing that to happen to his wife, and it teaches us a lesson that God always keeps his promises and that he's the one who upholds the burden of truth. Because when God makes a promise, he keeps it. Well, Abram and Sarai, they returned to Canaan, and only now they'd accumulated so much wealth that they started having other problems. Because you remember Abram's nephew Lot? Well, evidently, he also became wealthy in Egypt. And now, with both families having so much livestock, so many servants, it was difficult for the little community that they settled in to support everyone. So, Lot ended up moving. He moved across the Jordan River down to the fertile plains of the east. And I'm going to tell you, it was a selfish move. Uh, I can imagine it was difficult for Abram to watch him go. He had no children, and Lot had been like his son. But now he's making his own way in the world, and he was making unwise choices, but Abram really couldn't do much about it. He let him go because Lot wasn't his son, and he wasn't the promised one that God had said would come. And so in the midst of this moment of sadness and departure, God spoke to Abram for a second time. And he told him, look around, because every place that you can see with your eyes in any direction is all going to be yours and your descendants. In fact, you're going to have so many descendants that you won't be able to count their numbers. And once again, Abram set up an altar and he worshiped the Lord. Well, meanwhile, things didn't go so well for Lot. I mean, the place he settled in was not only exceedingly evil, but it was a nation at war. Kings from the north came and attacked the cities where Lot and his family lived, and Lot and his family ended up becoming captives, taken away as slaves. When Abram heard about it, he gathered all of his men, and he got some of the men from the local uh, cities to go with him, and they caught up with these armies, and they defeated them, and they rescued Lot and brought him back. Abram could have used this occasion to become wealthy even more, but instead he just made sure his men were cared for. He made sure that the people who lived around him got their due rewards. And then Abram worshipped God again. And so we see that God spoke to Abram. And he says, Abram, you just fought a war, and I want you to know I'm your shield, I'm your protector. Even though you could have gotten richer from this conflict, I'm going to make you great. Now notice this is the third time that God spoke to Abram. It's about 10 years after the initial contact that we know of. And Abram wasn't getting any younger. So he cried out to God. He said, God, he said, you've made this promise, but I still don't have any children. In fact, if I die, everything I have will go to someone who is not my child. And so the Lord spoke to Abram again. And he said, let me make this clear. Your very own son will be your heir. Not Lot, 
not a servant in your household, a child who is born to you. And to give Abram a sense of how big this would be, he said, look up at the stars and see if you can count them. That's the same way it'll be with your descendants. You'll lose count if you try. Now get this. This may be one of the most important parts of Abram's journey. In Genesis 15, 6, the Bible says that Abram believed God. And that was enough. God counted that belief as righteousness. It's a beautiful story because God gave something to Abraham, a picture to him and to all who have lived since him about who the God is that we believe in. He told Abram to prepare another offering. Now, every other time Abram had met with God, he did an offering, and so this was not unusual, but this time was different because this time God indicated that there was more to come. And he told Abram to take this offering and to divide it in half and arrange them on two sides. And then Abram waited, and God was silent. Abram waited more. Birds came and tried to pick at the offering and take it away, and Abram had to keep driving them away to protect this offering. The day was getting later and later, and still God said nothing. God did nothing. The sun went down, and nothing. Until finally, Abram fell asleep. And God ensured that it would be a deep sleep, and it was in his sleep that God spoke and said, Abram, your offspring will surely come, and your offspring will face trials. But I want you to know I'm blessing you with peace. Don't be afraid that your timing is not my timing. Now, you see, in those days, if you wanted to make a covenant with another person, it was customary to offer a blood sacrifice. In fact, both parties to the agreement would symbolically pledge this blood oath that signified that they would uphold their end of the bargain or risk death. But Abraham, Abram, was deep in sleep. And he didn't move. He couldn't move. God ensured that the sleep was so deep that he couldn't rise from his sleep. But God moved. He passed between the halves of the offering and symbolically was telling Abram, the whole weight of keeping this covenant is on me, Abram, not on you. Your faith is all that you need. Well, Abram woke up from that sleep with a renewed sense of purpose because he knew that God would uphold his end of the agreement. We're not so certain that Sarah knew that. She had watched her biological click, uh, clock as it ticked away, and she knew that her time for having children was really done. And so she said to Abram, well, maybe God wants you to help him. What if we work it out for you to take another wife? That's what other people do, maybe even just a mistress. Let's do what the rest of the culture does. That way you can have a child that will be your heir. Now, at 85 years of age, Abram knew he wasn't getting any older, and he said, I believe God, but maybe he does want me to act. <coughs> Sarah was 75, and she is still as beautiful as, as when they got married, but let's face it, ladies, 75 is not 25. I mean, does anyone know of a woman who's given birth at 75? And so Abram did as Sarah I suggested. He took a servant girl named Hagar as his mistress, And sure enough, a boy was born named Ishmael, and immediately Sarai regretted her decision. It's all your fault, Abram. I don't want to hear about it. You deal with it. And so Sarai did. She made life so hard for Ishmael and Hagar that they fled to the desert because in their mind it would be better to die in the wilderness than to live in the house of Sarai. How awful must that be? But ladies and gentlemen, can I just tell you, as a little aside to this whole story, Just in case you are ever tempted to believe that God only loves certain people, remember Hagar and Ishmael. God loved them, he pursued them, he looked out for them, and he blessed them. And so they returned to the household of Abram, and Ishmael began to grow, and Abram loved Ishmael as his own son. According to the customs, when when Ishmael reached the age of 13, he was considered a man. Now, Abram was 99 years old by now, and the Lord spoke to him again. If you're counting, this is the fourth time God's spoken. And he renewed the promise, only this time he made the promise even bigger. You're going to be, to be the father, not just of a nation, Abram, but of nations. There will be kings in your family line, and you'll have a land for an everlasting possession. And to show you that this covenant is real, I'm going to give you a gift, God said. 
a sign of the covenant that you are to keep from now on. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the part my Sunday school teachers left out. God said, the gift is I want you and Ishmael and every male in your household to be circumcised. Now, I don't know about you, but my Sunday school teachers, I don't think they use the word circumcision. And if they did, I can assure you they didn't tell me what it meant. My third grade class at Forest Hills Baptist Church, we didn't get into a discussion. And we were blissfully ignorant of what it meant if they even used that word. It's another one of those places where as Moses tells the story, he doesn't give us any details about how well the story was received by the people who are affected by it. And it just makes me laugh and cringe when I think about it. Because remember, Abram had enough male servants in his own household that he was able to put together a pretty decent fighting force. And frankly... I'm surprised that those men didn't rebel. You want us to do what? <laughs> it indicates to me that even the people who were with Abram were beginning to understand that there was a God he followed that could be trusted. And God wasn't finished. He said, Abram, he said to Abram, I want you to change your name also. From now on, you will be called Abraham. And Sarai will now always be known as Sarah. Now, in Hebrew, Abram means exalted father. And Sarai means princess. By changing their names to Abraham and Sarah, God essentially turned their singular names into plural names. And he wanted them to know that even the names that they carried would communicate their status as the father and mother to generations of people as countless as the grains of the sand on the seashore. Now, if, if I were Abraham, it might have been hard to hear those words about changing my name because I still at this point don't have the son of promise. Exalted father, where's your son? Well, I've got Ishmael, but the you know, circumstances surrounding his birth were sort of unusual. And now you want me to be called exalted father of many nations? You want Sarah to be a princess of the world? Or maybe something else was on Abraham's mind, like that whole thing about circumcision that they had to do. But a new thought came to his mind. He said, oh God, I wish that you would make Ishmael the child of promise. That would be enough for me. But God would have none of it. Again, he emphasized, no, you and Sarah will have a child. And just to show you how serious I am about this, his name will be Isaac, which in Hebrew is translated as laughter. Once again, Abram demonstrated his faith, this time through obedience, to keep the sign of the covenant that God had given to him, and all the men in his household were circumcised. Well, not too long after that, certainly within the same year, God came and visited Abraham one more time. And this time I really mean it, God came in person. Actually, it was three men who showed up, and because of how Moses told the story, we know it was the Lord, and there are only a few times in the Old Testament when an appearance like this took place. This is very unique. This is very important, and here's what the Lord said. He said, the day I've been promising to you, Abraham, is coming. A year from now, Isaac will be born. That means Abraham will be 100, Sarah will be 90. She laughed about it. God called her on it. She denied it, but she laughed. And sure enough, a year later, laughter came into their household. The laughter of joy, the laughter of irony, the laughter of relief, the laughter of a promise fulfilled Isaac was born just one year later. Well, Abraham's story's not done yet, but I want to pause here today because Paul makes such a big deal about Abraham that we have to take this part and stop and we'll look at another part later and we have to ask ourselves why did Paul introduce this character into a letter that was written to this diverse group of people in a city known as Rome. Chapter 4 is all about Abraham, and if you don't know the story, Romans chapter 4 isn't real helpful. You have to know the story. And we looked at chapter 4 last week, and we read it in its entirety, and we've already begun to understand the beauty and the central teaching here. But because Abraham is the ultimate example of faith, his story gives us valuable lessons that we as believers, even here in the 21st century, need to understand. And so we have to know his story. So think about Abraham's journey. He was 75 years old when God first spoke to him. Up to the point in the story where we stopped, God actually spoke to him five times over the course of 25 years. Now, let me ask you a question. 
How many of you have ever had someone in your life who has been promising something, but they never deliver? Has that ever happened to you? I mean, the first time they spoke, you were excited and you were filled with joy, but then they forgot or they just weren't able to do what they said they would do. And so they tell you again, hey, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do such and such. And again, you're happy. You want them to come through for you. And because they told you a second time, you know they're serious about it. So your anticipation and your hopes are raised, but, but nothing. And then they come to you a third time. And now you're sort of like, well, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. I mean, yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. Well, what if that pattern repeated itself over the course of 25 years? Is it possible that you might lose faith? in your friend. Actually, if you're like most people, you more than lost faith in that person, you gave up on them. Now I want you to put yourself in Abraham's shoes. He desperately wants a child, a son. It's a, it's a culture that attaches significance to your family. The bigger your family, the greater you've been blessed. And God makes this grand promise. You're going to be the father of great nations, not just a nation, nations, kings, will come from you. You'll have a land in peace and prosperity. And during all these years, when God keeps making all these grand promises, nothing. So what do you do? How is your faith impacted in God? Well, ladies and gentlemen, there's a reason why Abraham is the paragon of faith, why he is the ultimate example, because what we see in Abraham's story is he kept on believing and trusting God, even when things weren't realized in his very view and vision. I mean, we already saw in Romans chapter 4 last week that he had hope against hope. Well, how hard must it be to have a hope that defies all hope? A hope that defies human experience. I mean, even at 75 and 65, when their journey first began, Abraham and Sarah were already at a point when having children wasn't a really strong hope. People live longer in those days, but humanly speaking, at their ages, they were already reaching the end of their childbearing journey. And God delayed, and He delayed, and He delayed for 25 years. It's almost unfathomable. And this is the reason why I think one of the, one of the most important verses in the Old Testament, one that I would like to encourage you to memorize, is in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. We referred to it a little while ago in the story, but it goes like this. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. Abram believed God and God counted that to Abram as righteousness. This is what Paul wants us to know about Abraham, that he was made righteous by his faith and not by his works. Because you see, in Paul's day, everybody was fixated on this idea that that the law could rescue them. And they were particularly fixated on this idea of circumcision. And frankly, I'm sort of fixated on that idea too. I can't imagine going through that as an adult. I don't want to be too graphic or even remotely inappropriate, but I'm just way too invested in that whole idea to act like it isn't a big deal. But if you're not careful, if when you read the story, you'll do the same thing that the Jewish nation did and make a, the kind of deal out of that that misses the entire point. You see, in Abram's story, it's sort of interesting. God had spoken three times when he comes the fourth time. And by the way, it was in that third encounter when Abram believed God is counted for righteousness. In the fourth encounter, God renews the promise and then he gives him the sign of the covenant. You might be tempted, as so many of the God-fearing Jews were tempted to believe, is that, aha, doing what God tells you to do is what makes things happen because it wasn't but just a year later after the circumcision that Isaac was born. Taking serious action is what you need to do if you want God to bless you and you want to be in his good, good graces. I mean, doesn't it seem sort of obvious? Do this, act this way, uphold your end of the bargain and the promise is yours. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Paul takes great pains in Romans 4 and the story of Abram in Genesis, as Moses tells, Moses tells us, gives us great, uh, takes great pains to tell us that that is not what happened. Before there was circumcision, Abraham knew the righteousness of faith. This takes us back to Romans chapter 4. I want you to look in Romans chapter 4, verse 13. 
Notice it says that for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. I, I, I always recommend that you do this. If you make notes in your Bibles, if you ever highlight things, that's something that ought to be highlighted. That is through the righteousness of faith. The promise that came to Abraham wasn't because he followed the law, but because he had faith. And ladies and gentlemen, what that means is, is that for every person who's ever believed that their works could save them, or for every person who's ever believed that, they've, that their bad works have doomed them beyond hope, or for every person who's ever thought that they could be good enough or jump through enough hoops to be able to receive the acceptance from God, Abraham teaches us that faith is the foundation for his righteousness. He believed God, and that was enough. And so Paul, that's the reason why Paul went to such great lengths in his letter here, to make the case for our brokenness and the fact that it is impossible for us to be saved. The impossibility of our salvation is what Paul wants us to understand in the last part of chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. It can't happen outside of God intervening. There has to be a miracle that takes place to rescue our human hearts. And even still, we know this, and you've heard this now for several weeks here in our church. We've talked about that it's not the law that saves, it's faith that saves. And people shake their heads and they say, yes, pastor. Even so, sometimes we believe that it's the law that separates good little disciples from the heathen. I mean, look at us. We follow the law. We're the good ones. Look at them. They're the lawbreakers. They're the bad ones. And, and sadly, it's us evangelical Christians, whether it's Baptist, Presbyterian, whatever the denomination is, people who have followed Christ as their Lord and Savior, we know better. We don't think of ourselves like this, but we find ourselves trapped by the law. Here we are, nevertheless. We read the Bible. We see that there are sins that we're supposed to avoid, and so we make it happen. Don't steal. Check. Don't covet, check. Don't bear false witness, check. Don't commit adultery, check. Don't pursue same-sex attractions, check, check. Because we all know that's the worst sin, right? And then we read things that we're supposed to be doing, that we're supposed to make happen. Honor the Lord your God, check. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy, check. Honor your father and mother, check. Care for the widows and orphans, check. I'm so on it, God. Look at me. I've got perfect attendance in church this month. I gave a bag of food to feeding Avery families. I put $20 in the offering plate a week ago. I pray for the missionaries. I went to a Republican rally. <laughs> By the way, we know that even though in our minds sometimes we check those lists off, we know what Jesus had to say about those lists, right? In the Sermon on the Mount. In the Beatitudes, and the things he said that if our righteousness is not exceeding the righteousness of the Pharisees, it means nothing. It doesn't rescue us. Because we know what's going on in our hearts, and we all realize that even though we may check something off the list, we still struggle with sin. So, you've got to dig deep into Abraham's story, and into Romans here. Because how did Abraham become righteous before God? Was it because he was circumcised? Was it because he followed the law? Listen, the only piece of the law that Abraham has at this moment is circumcision. All the rest of it is yet to come when Sinai happens in Moses. So it's not the circumcision, it's not the law that comes after him because God had already made the pronouncement that he's righteous. So look at this verse again, verse 13. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world didn't come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Notice verse 14. For it is the adherents of the law, for, excuse me, if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, 
There is no transgression. The idea there is, is that the law, the law of Moses hasn't come yet, but even before the law came from Moses, men knew the difference between right and wrong, and they were still found guilty before God. Just the law hasn't come yet. And so Abraham would still have died in his sins if he didn't have faith. Every person, you may not know the law of Moses, but it doesn't matter. You're still held accountable to your sin. And so what these verses teach and, and all the Bible teaches is, is that all humanity has one of two possible outcomes in front of you. One is to inherit the world as a descendant of Abraham, or the other is to inherit wrath. Verse 13, Abraham and his descendants inherit the world. Verse 15, the people of the law inherit wrath. So, who are Abraham's descendants? Well, in the previous two verses, Paul made the case that it doesn't matter whether you've been circumcised or you're uncircumcised, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, you're the offspring of Abraham. In Galatians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul is also writing, he said that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham comes to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. And he said, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So can't be much clearer than that, that if you, even if you're a Gentile, that you are a descendant of Abraham because through the Spirit you have received the promise. So the question we could ask ourselves is, well, then who's a Jew? Well, back in Romans chapter 2, Paul said that a Jew is not one who is one outwardly, but one who is inwardly righteous because of the Spirit. And so do you see what this means? It means that every person who has put their faith in Jesus is a child of the promise given to Abraham. Hallelujah. And so you can't listen to the story of Abraham like it's somebody else's journey. Abraham's story is your story. I have more than once in my, and I told you I'm a storyteller and I love to tell stories. And more than once in my lifetime, I've told stories about family members and things that they did. And I'm always so personally invested in those stories. And I love, and I want to get those stories right because it's my family, right? Well, when I was telling that story a little while ago, do you, do you realize that story is my story? It's your story. If you have faith in Jesus, you are the answer to Abraham's prayers. How desperately he wanted children. How desperately he wanted God to fulfill this promise that there would be descendants who would be unable to be counted, who would be like the sands of uh, grains of sand on the seashore or the stars in the heavens. You can't really count them. And so he desperately wanted God to answer this prayer and do you know why you are the answer to Abraham's prayers? Because there was a person who was born who was also the answer to Abraham's prayers named Jesus. In John chapter 8, verse 56, Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees and he said, Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day and he was glad. And in the context of that whole story, I won't tell you the whole story, but the idea was is that, that they had accused Jesus of being an illegitimate child and that his birth that he had no true birthright, and, he, and, and, and they were just really trying to discredit his ministry completely. And he was basically telling them that, you know, you think you're the descendants of Abraham. I'm going to tell you, you are not. Because you haven't, by faith, accepted Abraham's God. Not in the same way that Abraham did. And so, therefore, you may have some kind of outward uh, Judaism, but you are not truly Jewish. You are living in sin and you do not have your sins forgiven. And he said, Abraham saw my day was coming and he rejoiced about it. He knew I was coming. He prayed for me to come. Abraham knew that a Messiah was coming. And the reason why you're the answer to Abraham's prayers is because Jesus was the answer to his prayers. Isn't that awesome? Abraham believed the salvation of the world was coming through his descendants. Look back at Romans chapter 4, verse 13 again. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world didn't come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So once again, what is this promise? It's that you are going to inherit the world. Your faith in Jesus makes you a ruler. You're a king and a queen. I mean, this is, this is amazing. We have had enough with the bad news in Romans. This is the great news. Can you imagine the possibilities of this statement? <laughs> That you have been made an heir of this kingdom, of this world. And we're going 
We're going to, that's such an important concept that next Sunday we're going to take the whole Sunday to talk about what it means to inherit the earth, to inherit the world. Jesus said that the meek will inherit the earth. This concept shows up in the scriptures over and over again. What does it mean that we have been given this world, this promise that's been given to us? But for today, I just want to point out that, once again, that this only happens in faith. It only happens when your faith is in someone outside of yourself because in yourself you will never find righteousness. It only happens if you believe God and His salvation through the promised Son, not Isaac, but the one who came after Him, the man Jesus, the God-man, the royal descendant, promised Messiah, Jesus Christ Himself. That's why we say Romans is all about the good news. The, the marvel of this story is too big for us to process. You can't hear it enough, and your faith in Jesus makes you an heir to an eternal kingdom. And we need to talk about that over and over and over again. When the writer of Hebrews was talking about Abraham, he said that it was Abraham's faith when he was called to go to a place that he would later receive as his inheritance. He obeyed and went. Not because he was trying to get favor with God, but because he believed God, and so he went. Even though he didn't know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in this promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents. So did Isaac and Jacob. They were heirs with him of the same promise. Notice, it was Abram was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Abraham knew there was something better. Something better than the hardship of this life. Something better that God had promised him. And Abraham never saw it with his eyes when he lived. He never saw the ultimate fulfillment. He got to see a son. He got to see the journey of his children for this short while. But he never saw the ultimate fulfillment. And so Paul spent a lot of time dealing with all that bad news stuff. Well, the good news is here we can be righteous through faith. We are heirs of this world. And I pray that this week you'll lift your head up high because, because you are somebody in Christ. And if someone asks you, why are you so happy? I want you to tell them, I'm a child of the promise. I'm an heir of the world. And when they say, what does that mean? Say, I don't know. You're going to have to come to church with me next week so the pastor can tell me. <laughs> no, tell them that Jesus liberated you from your bondage to sin, that he invited you to trust him by faith, that you're a child of God and Jesus exchanged your sin for his righteousness and your brokenness with his perfection and you belong to the God of glory, the creator God of eternity. And that righteousness has made you a completely new person. All the old stuff has passed away. All the new stuff has come. Hallelujah. That's good news, isn't it? That's why Paul wants us to know about Abraham. You can't just read Romans chapter 4 if you don't really know what Abraham, what his story is all about. And if you have ever read that story in the Old Testament, you've been tempted to, to look at that in isolation from the story of Christ. You miss the point. Abraham points to Jesus all throughout his journey because he knew salvation was coming. Let me ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. We're his descendants. We are the descendants of Abraham. And Father, today we have this beautiful picture in the scriptures for us that's been painted that teaches us that, that we have been made righteous not because we figured out how to, how to cross the right T's and dot the proper I's and check off the do's and the don'ts on our list of goodness. Lord, you gave us things to obey and to be obedient to for a purpose and we will see those things, but our obedience is not where our salvation is. Our, our faith is where our greatest obedience is. We trust you. We believe in you, and we believe that you have made us, because of faith, righteous. Lord, I pray that if there's even one person here today who doesn't know the, the peace that comes with you through faith in Jesus Christ, that this would be the day of their salvation. And Lord, I pray that you would teach us, uh, teach us what it looks like to live in faith uh, and use these great uh, pictures in Scripture that we get from Abraham and others to know how we are supposed to face this world and this life that we live. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Oh.